Hey everybody, welcome again. Uh, a couple months ago we did the whistle video and we worked with uh, titanium and stainless steel. And on both Reddit and YouTube I got some questions about working with those harder materials. Uh, so today we're going to go ahead and make a video about that. Uh, I did get questions about both materials, uh, but I decided this video is going to focus on the titanium. So again, this is grade 5 titanium. It's also known as 6AL4V. Um, it's not pure titanium, as I said in the other video. It does have some vanadium and some aluminum in it. Uh, you know what? Don't. So grades 1 through 4 are the pure grades, and don't feel like you have to be a snob um, about pure titanium if you want to work with titanium. This actually has better mechanical properties and, that, and that's why it exists. And also the number is really meaningless. You, you know, don't feel like grade five is five levels below grade one because, uh, you know, like I said, the first four grades are all pure and grade five is almost the exact same thing as grade 23. Uh, so really don't put any stock in that number. If you want to work with pure titanium, you can. Uh, it's a lot gummier. It likes to melt and stick to itself. Um, this is just, it's a little easier to work with, and it has better, mecha better mechanical properties anyway. So I am going to continue to talk about stainless steel, even though this video is more focused on titanium. As far as stainless steel grades go, I definitely recommend, as I said in the other video, starting out with the 303. Uh, it's free machining. It's just easier to work with. Uh, 304 is very similar, but it's not free machining. Uh, you know, 316 and 316L aren't, aren't too difficult to work with either. Um, all good places to start with uh, stainless steel. So let's talk a bit about tooling. Uh, first of all, you, you don't have to feel obligated to use carbide tooling. Um, if you have it and you're comfortable with it, it's, it's great and go ahead and use it. Um, if you're not as comfortable with it, you're already working with the material you're not comfortable with, uh, go ahead and use a tool you are comfortable with. You know, I, I use carbide all day at work and um, Professionally, I would not cut titanium with anything but carbide. Uh, but when I get home, I, I tend to lean towards just sticking with my high-speed steel tooling, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so you are going to want a very sharp tool. Uh, so you're going to want to make sure that edge is fresh. Uh, you want a bit of a positive rake on that. This one's actually almost aluminum aggressive, which which will work, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that sharp. And then you do want a tool nose radius on the corner, too. You can tell I'm a little burnt there, but that's all right. Tell I'm a little burnt there, but that's all right. I'd recommend maybe like a 20 thou tool nose radius because uh, you want a nice big radius, but you want it to be less than your depth of cut. And we're still trying to figure out what your depth of cut is. It might only end up being a half millimeter if you have a tiny lathe. And that's why we're going to keep that tool nose radius in that 20 thou range. So a big part of this video is just best practices, uh, because when you're working with a harder material like this, uh, it's important that you just do yourself every favor you can and make your setup as rigid as possible. So one of the first things I'm going to do if I have the room, and we're going to assume we do, is support the cut. Um, even if it's a, a length or a diameter, I normally think I could get away with. Uh, if if I if I'm allowed to, if you know, if my part allows for it, I'm going to support it just for the additional rigidity. And you can remember, you know, a, a tip Blondie likes to talk about is, uh, you know, you can always make this end of your part longer and uh, cut off the center if you don't want the center on there. Uh, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to use a negative tool angle. And by tool angle, I mean the angle the tool is actually engaging in the cut. So when you're using a negative or a positive tool angle, you're actually stretching that chip. You're thinning that chip along a longer cutting edge, and your machine is going to love you for it. Now, you do kind of get the same result with a positive tool angle. And uh, it's really common to use a positive tool angle, especially if you're a CNC guy, uh, because it allows you to control both faces and diameters with one tool and one setup. Uh, so, you know, we're always tempted to do that. Uh, but one thing about a positive tool angle, is that means that any deflection you have is going to push your tool into the material and it's going to eat up your clearance angles. Whereas when you have a negative tool angle, it's going to push away from your material. You know, there's always deflection. How much is it? How much of a problem is it? Uh, next time, you know, you're running a positive tool angle and, and you maybe hear some rubbing, uh, go ahead and try a negative tool angle and see, see what happens if that noise goes away. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we are going to use some heavy oil tool part. And we're also going to be using 
our automatic feed settings. We do not want to hand crank this. A lot of times that's the temptation when you're working with a material you're not familiar with because you're afraid you're going to feed too fast, it's going to be too aggressive, or, or you want to be able to feel out the material. Uh, but if you stall or, or you hesitate in titanium, you can create little hot spots and hard spots that become a problem on future passes. And uh, we really just want a nice, consistent chip size the whole way. If you're using a PD250E, go ahead and set up your gears for a 0.05 or uh, 2,000 feet per revolution, and that'll be just fine for these materials. So I actually started making that cut and realized that my camera was no longer filming. Uh, if you watch the whistle video, it seems like there's kind of a curse with filming titanium on this channel. Okay, so let's talk a bit about chip formation before we get back into this. So if you're working with the 303, that's the free machining stainless steel, uh, that's going to break chips readily. That's what free machining literally means. Uh, so that, even if your speeds and feeds are wrong, your depths are wrong, you might produce a longer chip, but it's going to break under its own weight. Uh, 304 and, and other stainless steels, uh, you should be able to break chips. You will have to get your speeds and feeds and depths right to do that. Um, if you don't have the right tooling, your speeds and feeds aren't quite right, uh, you might not be breaking chips. And, it, you know, it's okay to produce an elongated chip as long as you're controlling it. The key is, uh, you know, safety and not damaging your workpiece. And uh, the best chip is a broken chip. But if you can control a chip, you know, you, you can still do that safely. And that's where we get to titanium where you almost have no hope of breaking the chips. Um, you know, salesmen spend their lives trying to sell me things to break titanium chips and they all fail. It's just at the end of the day, you just don't plan on breaking titanium chips. Just don't plan on breaking titanium chips. I'm going to oil this again and get back into this cut here. So this is the one millimeter depth of cut I started with uh, that I accidentally wasn't recording. Um, when you're working with these new materials, I'd recommend starting off with about a half a millimeter depth of cut and just keep going deeper uh, until you feel like you're pushing your lathe and your tools too hard. Uh, you do, you want to take as big a chip as possible, uh, not just for material removal rates, but because it's the best way to cut. And, and um, you know, especially in the stainless steels, uh, you can be pulling chips, you're pulling heat out of your material uh, by taking that larger chip, and that's a good thing. Uh, titanium's a bit of a different beast uh, when it comes to heat that's considered a, a heat resistant material and it can be quite a pain in the butt in that regard. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and engage and uh, just start cutting. Get our feeds right. Yep, right there we're producing a nice chip. And we lost it. So I actually realized the reason that we lost control of our chip form on that last pass was because my cutting edge chipped out. Uh, so I am taking my own advice. I reconditioned the tool totally, and uh, we are going to go ahead and make another cut. We're going to try that at a slightly lower depth of cut. We're going to try a half millimeter depth of cut. Uh, one thing I think I forgot to talk about was speeds. I made that last cut around 1,000 RPMs on 3 8 diameter material. Uh, that's about 100 surface peep per minute. If you're running carbide tooling, you probably want to double that. Um, if you feel like your tools are dragging, uh, if you can hear them tearing, you can turn up your speed a little bit. If you're working on a larger diameter, obviously your RPMs are going to go down. And there you go, that's what you're trying to avoid. I still get no curl. Okay, boys and girls, I pulled out that old tool. I just need to regrind that one. I threw in my rougher with a fresh radius. Uh, we're going to put some oil on it, and I am going to eat my words here. Check this out, guys. Look at those break. like music to my ears. Professional me is embarrassed. And still, a decent finish. Look at these chips. Break, break, break. Okay, a few things that I wanted to get in the video but didn't talk about earlier. Uh, the first is radial loading, which is um, working... Uh, 
perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Um, if you're familiar with mini lathes, you've been waiting like 10 minutes for me to talk about this. Um, but you, you know, anything you do that's radially loaded is going to be difficult. And that's, that's always the case on these mini lathes. Uh, but facing operations, you're probably going to have to take light face passes. Um, you know, you're probably going to have to cut off with a hacksaw and then reface the back face. Um, if you do have to do some grooving or plunging, it's good to take a smaller tool and kind of zigzag your way in, uh, clear things out, and then get in there with a tool that has better geometry for you once you've cleared things out. In fact, I kind of have a habit, I'll be honest, I kind of have a habit of, um, like, uh, beating the heck out of uh, carbide thread inserts, just to use them to, to kind of rough out undercuts and stuff like that. Uh, and the, the, the other thing I want to talk about that I didn't mention earlier uh, was just to plan for substantial finish passes. And that's, again, kind of a best practices thing, um, but it does come really practical with some of these materials, and I've definitely experienced it specifically with stainless steel, you know, where if you get in a situation, you know, where you have to take one or two thou off the diameter, um, you know, it's really hard to skim that off, and your tiny little lathe might just want to push away that two thou instead of cut it. You can end up with taper. Uh, you can end up rubbing your finish and damaging it. And, um, yeah, so, you know, plan, plan on leaving substantial finish passes. Make sure you're planning around that. Okay, now I did promise to show you guys something at the end of the video, and this is that surprise. Uh, this is crystallized Damascus titanium. Uh, it is just awesome, and I've got a bunch of projects planned for what we have here. Um, you can get, like, Damascus titanium, where it comes in the bright titanium heat-treated colors, um, but in more of a regular Damascus pattern, so, like, more zebra stripey. Um, but I did, this is the only shop I've seen making this stuff, and it's out of Kiev, Ukraine, and I'll link it down in the description. Uh, this stuff is really spendy. I, I mean, titanium is spendy, and Damascus titanium is even more spendy, and this is even more spendy. Um, but I will link it down in the description if you want to get some yourself. Uh, if you don't want to get some yourself, you can just look forward to some future videos where we're going to make some really cool stuff out of this.